determinateness as requiring material incompatibilities, as consisting in what's ruled out by something, whether we're talking conceptually or ontologically. Uh, that's the way to think about something being determinate. Uh, in terms of Aristotelian contraries, uh, in other words, and thinks of propositional negation as something like the minimal contrary, the one that's entailed by every contrary uh, of things. And, and that's why he sees the content as being reached out uh, the content, the substantial content that's in, uh, that's in the contraries. But when I say that he keeps uh, the principle and puts it at the center uh, uh, of his thought as I guess as a loyal student of David Lewis, I, I think one must, but as I don't, um, I don't think it's exactly a reductio to deny it. But I think you couldn't, in principle, have any reason to deny to deny the principle of non-contradiction. Why not just keep it too? So, mm. and, and, and I think Aristotle didn't. But, oh, sorry, that Hegel didn't. But um, <coughs> his view is that. When we find ourselves with incompatible commitments, that obliges us to change something, to, to change our beliefs, to change uh, our concepts. And that is to, to accept the normative force of the principle of non-contradiction. If you say when you find yourself with incompatible commitments, that means you're, you're normatively obliged to do something different. That is acknowledging the force um, of the system, uh, the force of the principle. I think what's radical about um, his claim is not any of that. He's, he's really quite um, traditional in all of that. What I think is radical is his interpretation of the empirical inexhaustibility of the world uh, in terms of the claim that every set of determinate concepts that we have, if we correctly apply them uh, in the actual world, following the norms that are implicit in them, we will be led to incompatible commitments inevitably. Every set of them will. Uh, and the response to that has to be to change them, to move them, to improve them, but that's not on its way to some um, set of determinate concepts that won't get us into, into trouble. And that's where the, where the dynamic aspect uh, comes. And, and I think that pick, I think that's a very interesting notion of exhaustibility. And I don't think that that uh, is hot, that picture is hostage to uh, a propositional understanding of or uh, that sort of interpretation of the principle of non-contradiction? Um, I don't think I, I, I don't think I disagree with uh, just about anything that you said. Um, I suppose it's just in, in my reading of Hegel. I mean, there's a sort of a doxographic issue, I think, um, about how much Hegel uh, needs to use the resources of term logic. Because this is sort of the traditional way he's been damned by the sort of you know people after Russell that doesn't know anything about modern logic conception, so it all goes terribly wrong because of that. Um, I think there's a grain of truth in the degree to which he uh, is committed to the sort of Aristotelian conceptions of term logic, that the thought determinations. Um, and their role in perception. Um, and in some sense, they sort of, they keep on coming back, right? And I think the, the way they keep on coming back is bound up as part of the explanation of why thought gets into this never-ending system of contradictory thoughts. I think there's a sort of an explanation for, for that phenomenon, and it re relies on the persistence of these different sort of logical structures. I mean, effectively, it's the logic of being thought categories that I think of as the ones that are for him are, um, are more Aristotelian and the, the logic of essence are sort of the more modern sorts of ones. And it's not as if the modern ones get us to sort of wash the other ones away. They keep on coming back. Um, such that if you think of them as being washed away, I think from Hegel's position there would be um, a, a sort of an error of thinking of the categories that you get out of a sort of modern system of logic as being the right ones. Uh, I don't think he thinks of them as they're, think he's, they're contextually right for certain sort of situations, sort of reflective ones. Um, but the sort of Aristotelian ones just do fine and are needed for other sorts of 
situations. Um, so I guess it's this sort of persistence of I mean, persistence of immediacy. Now all these issues about immediacy and the role of immediacy for Hegel that um, uh, don't make him quite the critic of the myth of the given that he is taken to be. I mean, he, he, is, he is and he isn't, <laughs> to put it in a contradictory way. Um, so uh, maybe, it's just a, 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 maybe it's just a difference in emphasis, um, or it might be a difference in uh, sort of actual doxographic understanding. Well, look, I mean, it's, it is the conception of immediacy, the inexhaustibility of that, that I think um, it, it is the radical is the radical conception that leads him to think that we can't have a status of determinative concepts. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I, I sort of tend to think that there's more, you know, in terms of your there's more of the McDowell and Hannigal in this idea of, of experience than Yeah. Um, you said that uh, because of Russell we've forgotten how much logic people knew in the nineteenth century. Uh, but from your presentation, you seem to be forgetting how long the 19th century was. Uh, um, Hegel was around in the 1830s, yeah. and you spoke about him adopting ideas which Frege would express 40, 50 years later, and hadn't yet. Yeah. I think a lot of not all, but a lot of what Hegel is talking about when he talks about contradictories is in fact an attempt to develop a vocabulary for talking about relations. Uh, but he didn't, I mean, it, it was, that, that was a known problem since mm. Jungians in the 1600s. But and he was trying to express ideas which we would, we Brazilians say are ah, logical relations. Mm. But he's trying to express those ideas without that vocabulary, yeah. and he's mis. Is that? Um, yeah, yes, I think. Okay, I mean, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I'm not trying to sort of claim his, him as an anticipator of <laughs> yeah, the late 19th century and the sort of revolutions in logic or anything like that. But I think that, I mean, for example, Russell's <coughs> account of it is far too overdrawn. Russell's account of these sort of logical adults, where he doesn't know anything about that logic. And just <coughs> get into all sorts of problems because they un uh, unreflectively rely on the on the <coughs> structures of, of syllogisms. It's just wrong. It's certainly wrong at Kant. Um, and the paradox is that you know Leibniz is held up as the, the, the great mm -hmm. sort of anticipator of modern logic and Kant's criticisms of Leibniz are effectively a sort of modern ones. Right? Um, uh, and he's anticipating the sort of Deep structure of modern logical thought in his criticism of life. It's nothing to count. Uh, Hegel's on this side of the count. I was just wondering whether you might clarify just a small, small part of your paper, and that's the contrast you made between Proust and Bob's understanding of the um, um I'm not familiar with, with, with what uh, Graham's view, but as, as I understand Graham's view, um, he thinks that you can cite cases where you accept the premises and you come to a conclusion. Um, as I understand it, the, the one very simple way of understanding it is that, that, that uh, the law of contradiction isn't a, a, a constituent of a valid inference. It, it is a norm. And I did put the question to him, and, and you can see that, yes, that is more normative. Um, and I thought I had an understanding of what that might mean, but you also said that, that Bob's view was that it's normative as well. So I guess my question is, how do you understand the contrast and how do you understand the normative? Right. Um, um, I really hesitate to try to say in public, in some sense, try to uh, get Graham's position right. Um, but as I take it, I mean, it is a fairly sort of philosophically radical position. Um, and there are all these sort of people who want to entertain the idea that there could be possible worlds in which there are true contradictions. Um, but there's only a small subset of those <laughs> who say this is one of them. Um, now, I, I just sort of, I guess I'm, I guess I'm worried about that claim and I, and I don't